Howdy, folks, and welcome to another episode of TFL Talking Trucks. And we are going to do many things in this video, including answering the answers of the questions of the questions that you questioned us. No, wait, it's better. <laughs> we're going to be actually we're going to be talking about yeah. some of our top vehicles that we've driven, our top trucks that we've driven yeah. for 2022. And we are going to be talking about the quiz that we posted last week. Yeah, because we promised that. We said, uh, are you a pickup truck enthusiast? And we came up with really an awfully long list of questions. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> and, and combined, the amount of questions, uh, th th there were quite a few of them. So what we're going to do is we've picked a few of your answers and we're going to pull them out. We're going to try to kind of hit as many as we can, but we may not cover all of them. And if not, by all means, in the comments below, list what you think we've missed. Yes, and also, like Nathan said, we're going to be talking about some of our top five favorite trucks from the year. This is December 2022, and we want to kind of start doing the wrap-up shows. Yeah, and this is one of kind them. And kind of look um, you know, behind us a little bit, and then also look forward to the future. That's right. So we have that, and uh, there's also a question here which also ties into one of the uh, questions we put out there, and that's this one here regarding this person who has a list of vehicles that tow well that don't have frames. Yes. Did you want me to cover that as well? Sure. Yeah, let's okay. let's start there. You want to start there? But, but first, we have to do one thing. We have to thank our Patreon supporters. Right. Patreon.com slash TFL car is our only page across all of our eight channels and four websites and two podcasts. Wow. Uh, but uh, recently, Christopher Bragato supported this uh, with a donation on Patreon.com. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this is where you guys can just talk to us, interact with us directly. It, Questions, feedback, everything. It's like having a direct line to God. But in this well, case, um, well, well you're close. Just, that, would, that would be insane. Uh, the point is, is that, yes, we try to read and answer a lot of the questions we get via you know, email and text and obviously through our websites and channels. But this is a direct way where you will get an answer. You will get something sent right back to you. And on top of that, quite often read here on a, one of our podcasts. So definitely... Highly advised if you want to talk to us, this is the way to do it. Yes. So do you want to kick off with Tom Ski and his email? That's his handle, Tom Ski. Tom Ski. <laughs> so it's either Tom Ski or Tom Ski. I like the, I like the Tom Ski part. Tom. That, that definitely sounds a little bit um, more, more Russian. Polish. Oh, is Polish. Yeah. Pol okay. Yeah. yeah. I have some of that in my family too, so I'm not trying to put anybody down. Um, okay. Listening to your quiz podcast I would like one of your podcasts to address what exactly constitutes a proper frame, as Nathan calls it, on the Nissan Frontier, and why does it make for such an awesome tow vehicle? Off the top of my head, I can think of a lot of unit body vehicles that will tow significantly more than the Nissan. And he lists the Jeep Grand Cherokee, Dodge Durango, Land Rover Discovery, Porsche Cayenne, Mercedes Sprinter. That doesn't have a frame, doesn't it? Or it doesn't anymore. Or does it still? Well, see, the vans are, the full-size vans are kind of interesting because they're transitioning from like butt, true body on frames right. to a little bit more integrated But it's an uh, integrated bodies. frame. It still has yeah. a frame, though, in it. Okay, yeah. uh, Ford Transit and the pre-express full-size GM vans. Once again, so that does have a frame. Okay, um, and I can answer my part and you can answer your part. Sure, okay? sure. Um, there's a couple things that are happening when you're towing. I never said that unibody vehicles can't tow. As a matter of fact, I think many of them can tow quite well. As a matter of fact, you mentioned the Dodge Durango. The cool thing is the Dodge Durango is a monster for its size. And if you get the SRT, the 392, or some of those packages, you could tow over 8,000 pounds. Yeah, and we've done this. We have videos to prove that. Indeed we do. Up yeah. the Ike Gauntlet. Yeah. I mean, it's a beast. Now, where I'm coming from has to do with something. If you tow often, one of the things you'll notice is that if you have a frame... The frames are far more tailored to towing often and taking a lot of abuse. It's an extra strength member, and it takes a lot of the stress off the rest of the vehicle because it's all centered on that component, which in itself is a hunk of iron or a hunk of steel, right? When you are tying into an entire vehicle, even though they're very stout, you're going to feel a lot more inside the cab, at least this is my experience, you're going to be pulled around a little bit, especially high winds and whatnot. Those are the times when you really notice it. Or if you're towing off-road, that can be a real strain on unit body. 
that's trying to pull a trailer. So those are just some of the examples I have of why a frame-based vehicle makes a much more intelligent choice for long-term towing. Yeah, I would agree 100%. I would add, though, that the frame, like you're saying, is a, it isolates where the trailer is attached, right. right? The hitch is directly mounted to the frame of your vehicle, be it, well, we recently drove the Sequoia, right? The new Sequoia has a frame underneath its it body. It certainly does. And the hitch is attached directly to that. And of course, the body is attached on top of the frame. Mm -hmm. But there's a separation here. If you have a unibody vehicle like Durango, it's really actually pretty, quite good at towing. It's a rigid vehicle. Uh, yeah. yeah, and there's not a lot of sway. It handles it very well. Fairly well, yeah. There's a, but but okay. sometimes you could hear the hitch, mm -hmm. right? Kind of, because that sound is or transmitted. Even, or even feel the vibration of the hitch sometimes. Yeah, like the trailer kind of bouncing on top of it. Right. You could kind of sometimes hear it or feel it through, through the vehicle because it's kind of almost one piece. Right. Right. And also, and I learned this with Mr. Truck many, many years ago, when we would use weight distribution hitches, right? Where you actually, uh, you know, add that attachment to the hitch, kind of lift up the vehicle and the trailer to make it more level. Yeah, so there's less uh, squatting. Exactly. Uh, the unibody vehicles, especially some of the older, like Touregs and Cayennes. Mm -hmm. Cayenne, Porsche Cayenne is on his list, right? Yes, it is. What you can do is you can start to kind of warp that unibody a little bit by adding extra kind of... I was hoping uh, you were going to mention that. Yeah, so... That's not ideal. No, it's you, not. For, for heavier trailers, you do want that frame. Uh, that's why all the heavy-duty trucks still have frames. That's right. So to simply put it, if you want the best type of rigidity and performance for towing a trailer consistently, taking abuse and just coming back for more, having a frame really is the way to go. And so my point was with the Nissan, which it did tow quite well, the fact that it has a frame as opposed to, let's say, the, uh, whatchamacallit, the Ridgeline, mm -hmm. which doesn't, and only tows a little bit less. If I had to choose between the two of them to tow, say, 4,000 pounds all the time, I would choose the Nissan every single time strictly because of that frame. Okay. Yes. So I want to mention a comment uh, from Dan McLaughlin here on our first uh, previous episode uh -huh. uh, where we were asking the questions. Uh, Dan has an interesting comment. Um, he says, useful for people new to trucks or coming back to trucks after many years. More videos oriented toward the basics would be good, especially with EV trucks. There's a lot of new people coming into this space. Well, thank you, Dan. Uh, first of all, that's an interesting take, an interesting perspective. Um, because often I glance over, for example, setting up a trailer brake controller Yeah. when I do a video about towing. Maybe I shouldn't glance over it. Maybe I should actually spend a little bit of time and actually kind of discuss that. Well, especially for people who just don't know what a trailer brake controller really does or how it works. Yeah. Yeah. I, I truly believe that. So how about, how about this? Uh, on tfltruck.com, which is our truck-focused website, I will publish all the questions and all the answers uh, to this quiz, and we'll highlight some of them here because if we read everybody's response, three hours, at least, at we'll least. be here yeah. for three hours. Yeah, we try to limit to less than an hour. <laughs> so w there's another response here that we have printed out from uh, is that Stephen Young or Spencer? Spencer Young. I'm sorry. Yeah. What, what does Spencer have to say? Um, well, Spencer is talking about the difference between truck sizes and their gross vehicle weight rating payload. And it looks like you have here axle ratio, biggest number, better for towing, makes for uh, blah, 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 blah. I'm not able to read right now. Axle ratio, bigger number, better for towing and aftermarket big tires. There yeah, is absolutely. not a best axle ratio because they are paired to specific transmissions. Thank you, Spencer. I've been talking about this for years, it seems. So, so some of the questions we asked, you know, what's the difference between different classes of vehicles? Yes, definitely. It's gross vehicle weight rating, right? Because how you can, that's how you judge the capability of a truck. Mid-sizers go up to about 6,000, just over 6,000 pounds. Uh, half tons like an F-150 or a Silverado 1500 go up to about, what, 7,500 pounds yeah, somewhat, take, yeah. uh, on gross vehicle weight. Of course, heavy duties go between about you know 10,000 to 14,000 for dualies and on and on and on. And also, the gear ratios, everybody says, remember when we do a drag race, we'll do a towing comparison. They say, why didn't you tell Ford and GM to use the same axle ratio? 
Dude, they have different transmissions. Exactly. Different ratios, yeah. different tire sizes. And also they're aiming for different things. Certain, uh, like for instance, a certain type of uh, ratio will give you better fuel mileage, but it won't be as good for towing and some are better for off-roading. It's, it just, it depends on the vehicle and its mission statement. And that's one of the problems we have is that, no, <laughs> the automakers will not compare with each other. They'll do it on their own thing for their own reasons. And, and the way we compare yeah. them, we take them, let's say there's a Silverado 1500, right. a Ram 1500, and an F-150. They all have similar you know, engine types, mm -hmm. let's say premium engines, right. be it a 6.2 from GM, 5.7 from Ram, or maybe an EcoBoost, right? Yep, Twin yep, Turbo yep. from Ford. And they e each have comparable towing capacities, mm -hmm. let's say 11 or 12,000 pounds. Okay. That's how we compare. Yep. <laughs> We don't say let's replace the differential here and you know let's change the transmission I'm, there. Yeah, hold on one second while I make a phone call <laughs> to the top of General Motors and say, "Hey, I want you to replace this, I don't know, 373 or whatever with something a little bit more usable in the rough." It just doesn't work that way. We we can't do it and they rarely do it. You won't it's rare. Sometimes they will use the same axle, same ratio, same everything. But it's not that common. And so, yeah, that is that is one of the issues. So we had a t question about tow haul mode, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Spencer and Tom and a lot of you just nailed it. Yes. Um, it kind of changes your transmission mapping, transmission, the way your transmission behaves. But there's a but, and, I, and I've learned this after driving on our MPG loops. Oh, sorry, my, uh, my con the cable okay. connection You're is good now. going out. Um, is that steady state highway driving no matter if you're in tow haul mode or not, you know, when you're kind of maintaining your speed on a flat highway, it behaves the same way with or without tow haul mode because mm. it only helps to slow down if you're in the mountainous terrain or if you're going decelerating and accelerating. Uh, that's when the tow haul mode is most important because it also tries to keep, you know, not shifting too often, right? Not overheating the transmission too much and just keeping in the premier and prime torque band of that motor. Can I add a little more to that? Yeah. When some vehicles are intelligent en enough to when you put tow haul mode on, it'll actually change a couple of the other settings electronically, like in the screen and one of the some of the information you're getting. Perhaps it'll change even some of the cameras. I think that some of them will immediately fire if you have like cameras glued on or taped onto the back of certain trailers. There's a bunch of different programs that can work. And I believe that tow haul mode will make those things come alive as well. One I really like in GM trucks is when you click tow haul mode, the transmission temperature gauge immediately appears. Which is something we've been asking yeah. every automaker to do. It's or, really or making it easier, right? right? Making it more accessible. Right. Well, yeah. and some don't have coolers for their transmissions, which is still strange. Can I see the list of questions? Here we uh, go. Over here. Um, and I think you guys, you know, most, most of you guys really nailed it. And some of you guys said, you know what? You know, I thought I, I was into trucks, but I, I didn't have quite everything... You know, they weren't prepared to answer every question. Yeah, which is interesting. And look, you're not the only one. Which is one. totally cool. Yeah, actually, the, those who are willing to question and ask questions are the ones who tend to be the brightest anyway. Um, by the way, there's. This, I wanted to read. The, jump to number 15. Yeah. The difference between a 3500 and a 5500 is the turning radius. Heck yeah. Isn't that an interesting? I, that one I did not know. So, I completely did not know that one. So here, uh, that was one of mine. So uh, here, here's uh, what I wanted to point out. The um, heavier medium duty trucks, the 4500s and 5500s, have a slightly wider, slightly wider front axle track, you know, more stability. But also it allows them to cut the wheel when you steer a little bit more at a more sharp angle. So you're saying that the, the 5500 will turn sharper than the 3500? Yes. So Whoa. that's why a lot, you know, a lot of hot shotters should actually step up to those bigger trucks, even though, you know, uh, even though the engine ratings are a little bit different because they're judged and rated a little bit differently right. on power and torque, but still they're more solid. They have heavier suspensions and they turn sharper. Now, uh, I, I, while we're on this and answering a few that stood out, now one of the questions I asked you guys was about ax, uh, you know, talking about the best axle ratio for off roading, and it's not necessarily the best, but this is the one that is popular amongst automakers for putting in serious off road machines, and that's four tens. And you can find those in the power wagon front and rear. You can find them in the Jeep um, 
Wrangler uh, Rubicon front yep. and rear. And also, I believe you'll find those in the Bronco as well, the uh, higher-end Broncos. Am I correct? And also the Raptor. The Raptor as well. Yeah, so it's kind of, it seems like a like a common ratio. So when we we're talking yeah. about ratios that aren't very common, in this case, there are some exceptions. But those tend to deal with off-roading, not towing. Yes, totally. And it just has to do with, you know, how the crawl ratio, right? Mm -hmm. That's really important for off-roading. Yeah. The, 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 the higher the number, the lower the gearing, mm -hmm. and the slower you can go. You can move over obstacles at a slower pace. But it's not as efficient. Exactly. Bingo. For example, our affordable truck Ram 1500 uh, two-door yeah. has a 321. It's a 321. Yeah. Which is better for efficiency. Not so great off-road. Yes. There is also a question I think you asked, uh, what's the, uh, what are the four types of trailer brake? Remember? Yes, yes. I'm curious to what the answers were. Uh, I believe I believe we have an answer here somewhere. Uh, well, while you're looking for it, okay. I can tell you um, one of the ones in there, it's kind of a trick question because one of the types of trailer brakes is actually a system of braking, and that is surge braking. Um, that is something that you'll find in a lot of boat uh, trailers, like Andres. Like my old trailer, yeah. my old boat I trailer. I think some travel trailers have it too. But the cool thing about a surge brake system is that you really don't have to tie anything into your vehicle. You're not really controlling that much. It's really doing it all on its own, all based on the weight that's going into the tongue from the trailer itself. And so it, that's how it estimates how much brake force is being pushed into the, uh, into the brakes at the wheels, which I think is super cool. Kind of just sits and does its own thing, but it does have limitations. And uh, Tomsky nailed this question. Uh, he says... There is surge brakes that you mentioned. There is air brakes. That's pretty easy because semi trucks, yep, larger trucks have actually air systems to drive their brakes, and Indeed. we can we can dive into that maybe at another show. Um, electric brakes, and there's also um, um, electric over hydraulic. Yes. So actually, the actuator may be electric, but, but the actual the actual fluid is still flowing. Right. It's right? hydraulic fluid. So there's. Those are the four we were looking for, at mm -hmm. least. Uh, and uh, the surge brakes, you know, they're good on boat trailers because uh, you go in the water a lot, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to have electrical actuation <laughs> when you're in water. It's constantly so, submerged, so, right? So, so um, but you know what? I actually swapped my boat trailer from surge to electric. Do you know why? I was, because um, you can? I, I was, no, I was overheating my surge brakes going down the Ike. <sighs> That's right. Because it's eight miles or more sometimes. And I remember depending. you roasted your brakes once. Yeah, time. because you're constantly going downhill, and the trailer thinks you're braking because you're on the 7% grade going down. Right. And it's constantly applying the pressure to the brakes because it's surge, it's mechanical. And I had a tendency to overheat my brakes on my trailer quite a bit. Which is one of the problems about living in the Rocky Mountains if you have surge brakes is the fact that they can be confused. I thought there was a way to handle that, but... I guess I'm wrong. Uh, well, maybe newer systems. My my trailer was 2004, 2003. So it's close to being um, 20 years old. Yeah, so uh, I think th I'm not sure what the latest state of the art is, but when I converted to electric brakes, um, I have to remember when I go to the lake, actually putting the boat in the water, I actually unplug my 7-pin connector from the truck. To prevent so, any water. So from there's no, actually, brake actuation while I'm in the water. So I always remember that. Okay. That, well, that's good. So. Yeah. And okay. I swear, I never forgot. Okay. Well, I believe you. <laughs> this is one of the few guys who actually uses a boat. Like... In Every, Colorado, I'm crazy. Yeah, really. no, most people will buy it and they'll use it a couple of years and they'll forget about it for a while and they'll sit and then they'll finally sell it. Andres, ever since I've met him... Gets that boat out there whenever the sun is out and the water is actually water. Well, it's, ice. it's also uh, driven by my wife. My wife really wants to get out there on the water. I'm trying so. to give you credit here and you're just throwing at me under the bus. No, I like towing. Okay. There my is. wife says, let's go to the lake. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. There's, as I said, there are a lot of questions here. We're not going to be able to answer all of the questions we threw out there or else the show would uh, take forever. Um Hey, let's, this one's a good one, though. I like this one. Yeah. What percentage of weight should be on the hitch? Yes. Now, this answer is 10 to 20%, depending on the load trailer type and load type. Ah, very interesting. Yeah. Yes, that exactly. In, yeah, because that crosses into a different one as well. Yeah, so the 10% is usually for conventional trailers right. that go on the hitch on the, back, on the back of your vehicle. Basically, where the bumper is, yeah. uh, you know, your, your level... Your, 
class three hitch or whatever. It's, yeah, it's different from sometimes people say bumper towing. Uh, and that can mean different things if you're in different crowds. <laughs> yeah. But there used to be and still are uh, a little ball you can attach to your bumper. But that doesn't have a very high capacity at all. No, it's you much could, lower than the other hitches. You, you can about. bend your bumper. You can bend that you know, attachment point. Mm -hmm. uh, what, when I say bumper towing, I mean like the hitch that attached to the frame underneath your bumper. Right. That's what I mean. Yeah. And, and that's 10% weight distribution. Right. But how, when does it go up? A gooseneck trailers or fifth wheels. Ah, yes. Yes, yes. So you got that. Now, I'm going to branch right over. Radio Magic. Ready? What, what? What? Now, what is the difference between the gooseneck and the fifth wheel? Thank you. Yes. So the goose, that was a question that we asked. I know. That's what I was trying to do with it. Uh, I, I tried oh, to branch it Thank you. It off. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's so right. the gooseneck looks like a goose. It's, it's an arm that comes over the trailer. It goes in the middle of your bed, How truck's bed. It? And it looks like a goose's neck, uh, well, leaning over, uh, leaning over your truck, and actually attaching to the center of your bed with a, with a, with an attachment. So the difference is the fact that it looks like a goose. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm, so I'm, that's the goose neck. Okay. It looks like a goose. Okay. But but now fifth wheel yeah. is what semi trucks use. But, but they use basically what's called kind of like a full size fifth wheel, where there is a kingpin that moves into the jaws, of the, this mechanical jaw device, right, okay. of the of the semi truck. And then for pickup trucks, for our smaller guys, you know, with dualies, mm -hmm. <laughs> I say it relatively speaking because semis are huge. Uh, it's called a mini fifth wheel. Basically, those jaws are a little bit smaller, but still the same principle where the pin goes into the jaws, you lock it down. Um, and with the gooseneck, you have to have chains. You have to have security chains. Uh, and with fifth wheel, you don't. And Mr. Chuck tells me you don't have to have chains on fifth wheels because of lobbies and because, of, because those are used on the recreational trailers. Uh, and apparently, the regulation is such is that you don't have to have chains. I would really like people to have chains regardless wouldn't you? Extra safety. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So, so to, to, to recap, a gooseneck, despite the fact that it looks kind of like a goose's neck, <laughs> fact, like fits down onto a pin. Yeah. There's a ball actually in, the, a in ball. your bed. Yeah. So it goes down onto the ball and the clamp's on, as opposed to a fifth wheel, which has a pin that hangs down and it actually slides in and connects to, kind of like a train, yeah. into a um, mini this little, jaw mechanism. Little yeah. jaw mechanism that will clamp it shut. They both have their uses, and one is better than the other? Well, so it's usually, it's usually the gooseneck has higher ratings. So, uh, and then you have to step up to a three-inch ball. So that's the side, the diameter of the actual hitch ball. Mm -hmm. um, when you step up to that, now, now you can go to 30,000 pounds, 35,000 pounds, and those are the big ratings, right? Those are the, when, when Ford says the new Super Duty will tow up to 40,000 pounds, they're actually talking about that gooseneck attachment. And 20% of the weight can go into the bed. And sh yeah, and then, then you have to have enough payload, right, in your truck to actually be able to handle that. So, so exactly. that's very important. Yeah. The fifth wheel, I usually rate it a little bit lower, uh, but still they can go up to 32,000 32, pounds of trailering. Uh, weight, trailer weight capacity, which is still huge, a huge amount. It is a huge amount. And so thank you. We were able to get kind of two in one on that one. Um, C-channel versus box frame. Yeah, what's up with that? Now, um, Spencer S. Young, thank you for writing the way that you talk because you actually put well. Yes. So C-channel versus box Well, there is so much misinformation. Short answer is C-channel is more for comfort. Boxed about a famous truck, unlikable Toyota Hilux dual double box. Blah, blah, blah. Boxed okay. frame is supposed to be stronger. Yeah, so at the end of the day, boxed frames, fully boxed frames became really popular in the late 90s, early 2000s when companies started advertising that they were doing a fully boxed frame and that it would create better rigidity, which is true. Um, fully boxed frames are more rigid than open C channel frames. Open C channel frames are lighter, and in some cases, by definition, more flexible. And yes. that may or may not be a good thing. So, and there's a big controversy surrounding this, um, just in the industry, right? So the Tundra and the Tacoma, like the current Tacoma, has a, a triple 
triple frame design, yeah. which is po- boxed in the center. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, boxed in the front, a little bit more open in the middle, and fully, fully C, open. Ch- C channel. Basically, it looks like a cross section, looks like a C. Right. Right. And why did they do that? Well, Mike Swear says, the chief engineer, that the rear end is a little bit more flexible, so there is better articulation, right? So it's, it, you know, it's a little bit more compliant on off-road trails. That is exactly his explanation. Whether or not you guys agree with him, we can't, we can't, yeah, that's not us. Yeah. Um, and then the other side of it is that there are people who do fully boxed frames that swear up and down. They can still get that really good articulation while having more rigidity. And then there's the other group of people who swear that having an open C channel frame gives you a better ride on the road and does not compromise the vehicle's ability to tow that much. Now, look, physics are one thing, but logic's another thing. I look at a fully boxed frame, especially on the full-size trucks, and I say to myself, hmm, that is something that can hold a lot more weight than a C-channel. A box just makes more sense, and it's going to be more rigid. That makes sense to me. So uh, there are a couple schools of thought out there, including Toyota's perspective, although did they keep that set, set up? The Tundra is boxed now. Now the Tundra is fully boxed. Hmm. So hmm, hmm. it wasn't before. Yeah. This is new. Yeah. So I have a feeling that they're moving in that direction as well, and they're not going to be able to sell to you their perspective of having greater flexibility for the rear part of the truck. Yeah, and, and then again, you might say, well, wait a minute. Don't some semi-trucks use open C channel frames? And some of them do. Yes. Still. And sometimes when you see a truck leaving the uh, red light, sometimes it tweaks a little bit right especially the, they got this some serious torque you know. yeah when the torque of that diesel actually tries to accelerate that heavy load sometimes the, the whole cab is actually you could see it tweaking which is pretty cool which is okay uh just one more minute on this topic and then maybe we should move on to our favorite trucks how yes, about that that's a good idea um w- one more thing i want to say is i heard one truck engineer tell me that if you can make this frame as stiff as possible then you have actually a little bit more freedom and control on how you design the spring rates and the shocks mm-hmm. of the actual system. Right. Because you don't have to worry about the frame bending. You only have to worry about your, your springs and your shocks working. So those are different schools of thought. That's interesting, uh, yeah. On the subject. Okay, uh, uh, real quickly, tire pressure, uh, those are usually listed inside the di- driver's door jam. Yep. Yes, they are, with one exception. What, what's that? If you get uh, aftermarket tires, oh yeah, yeah. So people always forget that. And one of the most popular vehicles on planet Earth to get aftermarket tires is a pickup truck. <laughs> Keep that in mind. You're uh, even if you replace the tires with exactly the same thing, make sure that the rating on the tire is the same as your door jam. It may not be. There are cases where sidewalls and whatnot are a little bit different in terms of thickness, and that can create a different type of pressure allotment. So just keep that in mind. And also, also the weight rating. We had the question about oh, weight yes, rating on the yes, tires. Yes. Uh, there's there are usually letters, uh, so load range D E F. Um, so you can look at those, and you know the, the F is you know obviously more stiffer and more carrying capacity than D or E tires. So right. that's how they're rated. There's also numeric values you can look at on your tire, but that may be another show. Yes. Um, but after all these twenty questions we asked, I think there's only one that matters. Okay. And I didn't ask it last time. Uh, here's how you know if you're a pickup enthusiast or not. It's how you park your truck. That's right. All of this is irrelevant. Uh, so maybe, did we just waste half the show? <laughs> Getting to that point where you're basically saying everything here is irrelevant because there's only one way to tell whether or not you're a truck human. Can you, do you guys know what it is? Yeah, we'll give you a couple seconds. Okay, tell them. If you back into your parking spot, you're a truck person. If you try to use your super duty and nose into a parking spot and you can't and you go diagonally and then you back out and you do it again and again and again and again, then you may not be a pickup truck person. All right. I can't even, I I won't even fully debate him because I mean, I'll I'll even back in in a Honda CRV if I have to. Um, The questions will be available or the answers to these questions will be available on tfltruck.com in the very near future. Yeah. And uh, we did answer some of these and we'll probably get back to a couple of these in a future broadcast as well. As I said, it just takes up too much time. And we had our final topic, which is talking about our best rides, at least our impressions of the best trucks that we've driven. Of the year. 
for 2022. Yeah, and this has been an amazing year. And I want to once again take a pause and thank you guys for watching our shows, yes. listening to our shows, uh, and which allowed us many things. It didn't just allow us to do normal stuff like follow the out of show season and go to SEMA and all those things. Right. But we're actually able to purchase several trucks this year and sell several trucks this year. Yeah. Um, which actually gave us better perspective into the truck world. Uh, we actually spent more time with each, each truck. Yes. Um, and so let's talk, let's talk about some of those um, and some of our faves. Well, it's pretty obvious that Andre and I both agree on what's behind us. And duh. <laughs> because it's the Ram TRX. So we started the year with the Ram TRX. God, Actually, we held on to it maybe too long. Mm. About a year and a half it was in our fleet. Normally, we try to do a year. Yeah. Right? Well, well you give or take up to a year, I should say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so it's still, you know, I think it's still the measuring stick in many ways as far as, as, far as truck performance, comfort, enthusiasm. Really, Fun. yeah, uh, other than efficiency, that truck really dominated everything, and for good reason. They built it to do that. But it's not the only truck out there that really turned our crank, I should say, or at least mine. Yes. Um, I found myself strangely attracted to the Chevrolet Silverado ZR2. Ooh, let me pull this up. And this one we actually had for several months. Yeah, we, uh, I'd say eight months? No, no, time. no, it was less. It was less? It was less. So... Uh, in the very beginning of 2022, we, we were able to purchase the Tundra. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we purchased the ZR2 for several months. Yes. So it was in our fleet this year. Yes. And I really liked that truck. I thought that, you know, I, I get it that a lot of you guys out there were really ticked off at Chevrolet or General Motors, I should say, for not building something that would go right up against the TRX and the Raptor. And to a degree, you're right. They didn't. Uh, but what they did is they followed their own path, and they built a truck that fills the type of logic that I'm looking for. As much as I love an overpowered beast, having something that I know I can drive every day that's not going to completely drain the wallet when it comes to gas, but also it's the right size. This is, a, is no bigger than a regular half-ton truck. It's and almost as the same width. Yeah, Absolutely. other than the tires yeah. being just a hair wider. And it has great power, but more importantly, it has front and rear lockers. It has great ar armor underneath, very good articulation, and a lot of power. Enough power to get you to where you need to go without going crazy. Yes, of course, it would be great if they would supercharge it, make it a super truck. But as it is for a comfortable, everyday truck that you can take just about anywhere on the friggin' planet, awesome, awesome vehicle. I, I agree with you. So remember two years ago, we had the Trail Boss, yes. the red truck. Are you wearing uh, the same shirt as you are in this picture? No, you're not. That well, one diff has different color. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. That's okay. I just uh, well, it's winter time. I like my I'm completely okay. With it. I'm sorry to interrupt, guys. I was I was I wasn't trying to be rude. It just freaked me out. Okay, <laughs> keep going. Almost the same shirt. Um, where was I? You oh yeah, Trail me. Boss. Yeah, Trail Boss. So Trail Boss. Remember that truck? Uh, just did everything we asked it to. It towed pretty heavy. Yeah. It was stable. It was relatively efficient. That one had the 5.3 yep. and a 10-speed. Of course, the ZR2 is equipped with a 6.2, uh, larger V8, and also the 10-speed. And it was like Trail Boss to the next level. Yeah. Uh, and the best way I can describe it, I was at Tumbleweed Ranch, and you weren't there at that time, but Grant and I think maybe Alex was, was with me. Mm -hmm. And Grant didn't experience the ZR2 yet. It was, you know, he's our marketing manager. Uh, you don't usually see him on video. Yeah, great guy. Uh, yes, absolutely. Awesome. But I was like, Grant, you see this little rocky crossing? I'm going to take it at speed. And he was like, what? <laughs> you know, and I, I accelerate. This is Tumbleweed Ranch. Yeah. You know, the approach towards the pond course there. I know exactly which one you're talking and about. And I, I went over it at about 30. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and actually... Almost nothing happened. You know, this, the DSSV shocks really took that hit, yep. absorbed it, never bottomed out. It just kept going. And I said, I turned to Grant, and he was like a little, a little tense because yeah. he didn't quite like that. And he turned to me and he said, oh, I see now. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of the difference between a standard 4x4 truck where you can see that he feel that jolt right in, inside the truck versus the ZR2 with proper suspension. And it actually was able to it. just absorb doesn't it. sweat it. It just doesn't sweat the, the hard stuff. It's, I just think it's a remarkable design. I think it's about three years too late. 
And I would agree as well. Also, I think it might be a little too expensive compared to. I know it's in between the prices of some of these other super trucks. It's a little too close to in my book, but nonetheless, a great drive. So this is one of my favorites from uh, this past year. Yeah, it's it's near my it's near my favorite on the list, but I wouldn't put it at the top of my list. Uh-huh. Um, so, like I said, well, let's just kind of go over the yeah, new let's trucks. Yeah, a, a couple of the other ones we have driven, right? So I mentioned the, the Tundra. So let me let me pull up the Tundra. Yeah, not on my top. This 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 was an important truck, right? Because it was a brand new redesign. Yeah. Of the Tundra after 14 years of the previous generation, and we were fortunate to be one of the first to actually uh, own one. Yeah, right? we went out and bought it. And Andre flew to Texas, jumped in the truck, and drove straight back. Yeah, that was actually that was exactly. A year ago, <laughs> it was in December of last yeah. year. Yep. Um, but so here's my take on the new Tundra after spending what seven thousand miles or eight thousand miles, you know, with the truck mm-hmm. um, and all that. It's a significant improvement, I would say, over the previous Tundra. Yeah. Okay. More efficient. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's got more higher power. tech, more power. Uh, it tows a bit more. Mm-hmm. It, I would say it's even. The suspension is set up in a way. Once again, fully boxed frame now. Yeah, yeah. And it tows like a beast. And remember, we did the Nike. It was one of the quietest trucks we've ever tested. It blew, This is where I... This is my favorite part of the truck. It's powertrain. Um, it was pulling at speed and accelerating, having no problems whatsoever, around, what, 2,000 RPM or 2,200 RPM? Turbocharged engines usually like to get their power much higher up. And this thing was kind of behaving like a diesel, even though it's not a diesel. And I was really impressed with it. And also, it was just whispering along, could care less about the, what it was pulling. I can tell that the engineers really cared about towing when they put that together. So that's, in my mind, one of the absolute best points of that truck. But from there, it goes a little downhill for me. And me too. And this is not my favorite truck of the year, um, even though it's good, like we said. Yeah. Uh, where I think it falls short. So... It's an improvement over the Tundra. Without it's a doubt. more efficient than the old Tundra, but it still is not quite up to par when you look at some of the, you know, where kind of everybody else is. I think they just got to where everybody else is, but they didn't leapfrog anybody. You see what I'm saying? Right. They they met our expectations, but they didn't exceed any of our expectations. And, yeah. And now they have a competitive truck, but not necessarily a class leading truck. And perhaps that's where Toyota wanted to go. They wanted to play the middle ground, which I can understand. Hopefully, if they can prove long-term reliability like they did with their previous truck, which is legendary. We just did a list which featured a ton of Toyotas on it. Yes. And the Tundra was on that list. and It was near the top. I think that that is one direction that would be awesome for them to go into. But also, they just don't have the features of some of the other trucks. And the, some of the other trucks are, in some cases, superior. Yeah, and for example, GM offers the diesel that's a little bit more efficient yeah, a lot than more even efficient. their hybrids. Yeah, I mean the Toyota hybrid is actually not super efficiency minded; it's more power minded. Exactly. Right, and it's and it's a beast. It does accelerate. It's like over five hundred foot pounds of torque. Five eighty three. Five eighty three. It's almost diesel heavy duty territory. Yeah, almost. That's pretty. I impressive mean, it's approaching stuff. that territory. So, so yeah, so that was a truck we've had a lot of time with. We did a full long-term update and, and everything else. Then we had the ZR2. Uh, we already spoke about that. Can I interrupt you? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to point out something very important. Now, a lot of you guys may have noticed that other uh, people out there do own these trucks and have been driving these trucks for a while and have been doing reviews on these trucks. Sure. Only TFL does the amount of testing, combined testing, that we do. We do our eye gauntlets. We do our MPG runs. We do off-road runs. We do towing off-road runs. Andre was one of the first people I know of ever to take one of those new Tundras, not only in the dirt, and but to drag a very heavy off-road trailer through water, mud, and rock. And There was I'm, a little bit of ice involved there, too. Yeah, nice. Yeah. I'm actually really proud of you for doing that. You, you managed I, not to kill yourself or anyone else. You know, Grant and Alex were with me on that. Yes, trip, uh, too. Grant, Grant aged 10 years. Yeah, I could see that. <laughs> he was, I he, think he lost a little bit of hair. He, he did l- lose a few follicles <laughs> here and there. So, uh, But I want to mention that. I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of the fact that we're able to multitask like that. And one of the things we do is the trucks that we get for long term, we drive the hell out of them. And that includes the next truck which I believe you're going to say is the Ford Lightning. Am I correct? Yep, it is. It was. Man, did we do stuff with that. So, yeah, and this was insane. Uh, We were excited by this, first of all, because it was 
one of the more approachable electric, all electric pickups that we could get our hands on. Correct. Of course, the Rivian was a little bit ahead of this as far as getting to market, mm -hmm. but those trucks were unapproachable. We, we never had a reservation for one because it was sometimes, I mean, originally it was like two grand, I believe, to put a reservation. It was a little bit too steep for us. Right. To just give $2,000 and then wait several years. But, uh, for it. And, uh, and you know that, uh, and I said this in another video, that I would choose the Rivian. It's my favorite electric truck currently being built. However, mm -hmm. the Ford F-150 Lightning is the more, as you said, approachable truck. It's based on other F-150s. It shows a ton of components with them. It drives like an F-150. A bit different, but it still drives like one. And for us, we also know it's going to be a volume seller. This will be a huge, it's already a huge selling vehicle for Ford. So we bought one and we put it through the ringer. Yes, uh, including Roman and team and with David. You did it too. And Cole, and I was part of it. Yeah. Uh, drove it to the northernmost point in the United States, North America, mm -hmm. uh, Pruto Bay, Alaska. Uh, which and, and at the end of three and a half months, we had it for three and a half months, maybe four months. Just close to four, I think. 13,000 miles, which... For us, I think it was the highest mileage truck in that short of a period of time. Right. As far as just putting miles on it and on it and on it. Because that's about the average of what a person would put a car on in a whole year. And we did it in a very few and, amount of months. Yeah, several months. And I got to say, so first of all, Roman and I, we'll, we picked it up in Dearborn. We drove it to Colorado. And then from Colorado, we went to Cal California for the camper, four-wheel camper. Put, put that shell... I, I was hoping to be one of the first to do an electric truck camper, but I think some other guys so, uh, beat us by a just, couple of weeks yeah, or maybe a, couple, a week. If that, yeah. Um, so, but still, we were one of the first. We were very happy about that. And then, of course, we were studying like the effects on efficiency, right? How does the camper shell, in this case, four-wheel camper, Project M, affects your efficiency. And tires. We put on more aggressive, slightly off-roady tires. Yes. And between those two things, we learned an awful lot about efficiency. But the truck looked like a million bucks. Yeah, the tires, the BF Goodrich um, trail terrains uh, were more aggressive. And we needed that. We needed that for Alaska, right? Exactly. We wanted t stronger tires. That, and they lasted, too. They totally took Alaska. People cut tires all the time uh, heading up north. Never, a, well... I don't have to knock on wood now because it's complete. It's gone, yeah. Uh, it's complete. Uh, but not a single flat tire. Nope. All the way on Dalton Highway, which is grueling, yes. uh, as, as we all know. Uh, and it's a heavy vehicle, too. Uh, with a camper and all of our junk inside of it and the coolers and the, you know, and the fridge, fridge we had in there, uh, it was pushing, what, I can't remember, 7,500 pounds, I think. Right. It's not a Hummer weight, but... <laughs> It's still a very a heavy, very heavy for a half-ton pickup truck, which is why one of the many reasons why our range was affected. Now, also keep in mind that when they took it up to Alaska, they were taking it into an extraordinarily rural area where chargers, level two chargers, yeah, maybe if you're lucky, fast chargers, yeah, you're not going to find them. And yet they were still able to go all the way up to the northernmost point and do it in an electric vehicle. And so... All of that experience, combined with the fact that we've taken this off-road, we've learned a lot about it doing that. We've towed the hell out of it. We've used it for towing left and right. We've done as much as we can in terms of learning with this truck. And this truck has been featured on other news programs before, and rightfully so. I would say that you have the most experience with this truck. Well, I, I think so. I mean, other than David and Roman driving it, what, three to 4,000 miles in Alaska, yeah, but you, I put you, a lot of the other miles on it. And you towed with it, and you did a lot of stuff with it as well. Yeah. So, so I would say, so first of all, what the way it's near the top for me. Mm -hmm. I think, after thinking about it, I think this may be my most favorite truck of the year, with a caveat, right? I would not buy the Lightning to tow a boat to Utah from Colorado. Not unless just, you wanted to take a long time. Yeah, it could take a very long time. Yeah. So long-range towing, this is not the truck for you. But considering everything else we've done with it, even with the camper and the tires and all this stuff, first of all, not a single software glitch. No problem. And I mean nothing. Not even a, like a frozen screen or nothing. 
As uh, far as I know, the thing was uh, rock solid. It was rock solid. Uh, powertrain was rock solid. Mm -hmm. And we put it through the ringer. We as, really as did. Said. We even did tug of wars with it. We did tug of wars with it. We towed extremely heavy yeah. with it. We towed long distance with it. We've done all of that. Yeah. And so, and it was also as, as hard as we used it, it was also comfy. Mm -hmm. uh, getting into it, you know, the four wheel independent suspension always takes care of you, just really nice and comfortable. And it feels planted, mm -hmm. right? Because of its weight, partially, but yeah. also the suspension. That's one of the big differences between this and a four, regular Ford F 150, like a gas or a diesel or a hybrid, is the fact that you have that heavy battery underneath your tush. And that brings the center of gravity down. And then it has a four wheel independent suspension. So its handling is actually far better than your average pickup truck. Yes. So I would put it as my favorite for this year. And, um, oh, maybe with one exception. But I wanted to ask you, as we start to wrap up this show, I wanted to ask you about this. Uh-oh. Uh, because I think we need to address this. Yep, that's actually the, one, the very one I bought. Uh, it's a Hyundai Santa Cruz. And you've heard a lot of talk about this recently because I went out and I bought one. And What, is this you? Yeah. That, that's right. You're, ha you're hauling a giant box and stuff. Yeah, I, I was probably about six, seven hundred pounds worth of weight in there. Uh, mattresses, boxes filled with uh, wood and uh, cinder blocks. I took out all to the dump. Two days after I bought it. Well, two <laughs> days after I got home and picked it up, I should say. Oh, sorry. No, yeah, no, no. Yeah, let's not show that other picture. Okay. So anyway, okay. Um, the reason why, and yes, of course, obviously, this is one of the vehicles I really enjoyed buying. Uh, or more importantly, I enjoyed driving, and as such, I bought one. Um, but you have to understand, guys, I, I had a limited budget. I get a lot of emails from guys and gals saying, well, you talk about a mileage being good at 25 miles per gallon. My Ford F-150 gets better. Maybe it does, but I didn't have the money for a Ford F-150. <laughs> you know, it's, that's kind or of a zero two for that matter. Or a zero two and all the other things I wanted. Yeah. Of course I wanted other stuff. I just couldn't afford them. So that's why I bought this. I, and I'm very, oops, sorry. That was my fault hitting it. That's okay. Um, I, um, I enjoy it. I've, I've had it now. Uh, just put a thousand miles on it now. And it's been great. I just did a little towing with it. It actually towed 2,000 pounds. No sweat. It likes it. It's just kind of a happy car. It's not a truck. I've never really said it's a truck. But I think it's a pickup. And it is, because it actually has a pickup bed. And I really use the pickup bed. So is it one of my favorites from this year? Yes. And so is the Ford Maverick. And yes, I could have bought a Ford Maverick instead. And the only reason I didn't is, well, two reasons. My wife really didn't like it very much. Something about it just didn't resonate with her. And I felt that the interior of the Maverick was just more comfortable for daily driving. I just liked it better. That's all. I, Maverick was fantastic. And I probably could have saved some money and gotten a good truck, too. So, uh, sorry, <laughs> pickup. So there you go. All done with that. Um, now, the next vehicle is something that he bought and I still think is exceptional. Really, truly exceptional. Well, the reason why I'm bringing this up uh, hmm. on this show is because I did buy it all, almost two years ago, actually. It's a 2021 F-150 hybrid that you may have seen on our, on our channel. We've done well. a lot of videos with this uh, truck, which I still think is a remarkable truck. Yeah, I got an XL F-150 crew cab FX4 short bed. Just basically what I wanted is to try the new hybrid powertrain, mm -hmm. and I did. And it's been solid. I, I want to say really, really solid. Um, and I also wanted to try the, you know, the 7.2 kilowatt system to charge other things with. And you did. Yeah. For example, this image behind me currently we're showing um, is my friend Justin King. It's, he's a friend of TFL. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually powered his home with this truck because he does have an um, interconnect system for a, a generator in his, in his house. It's like an inverter? No, like a switch on his oh, fuse where you can box. switch from one from grid versus um, external power. Uh, external power yeah, yeah. for like a generator would be, and he does have a, a Honda gas generator, but we used our truck, uh, my truck, to to power his home. But the reason why I'm bringing this up because it's not in in contention for this you know for this year is mm. because I'm decided to sell it. It's such a sad thing. I am it's bummed. It's a great truck. Should I sell it? I, oh, it's on tflbids.com. It's too late now. It's already it's up on bids. You're, you're committed, son. Uh, um, honestly, so I, I, I'm someone who keeps a vehicle pr pretty much I, for its life. But I also know that uh, Roman especially, but Andre occasionally, uh, they, they like to move to a new thing eventually and check something else out. And I get well, that as well. 
and I have been keeping my vehicles for a long time. Let me give you a couple examples. I had a Duramax um, Chevy 2500 Which diesel when for, I met you for 10 years. Yeah. I, it, I, I didn't have it for his entire life, but I did hold it for yeah. and drove it for 10 years and loved it. Yeah. I also had a VW Golf uh, TDI back in the day that I uh, owned for 18 years. And you loved it so much you sold it to a friend so you could still see it from time to time exactly. take a peek. Exactly. So I, I do have sentimental attachments to a lot of vehicles I have and own. But not this? I, I don't want to sell it, but I want to move on. Uh-huh. But that's, so, a fair, that's a fair response. So so here's where I am. Uh, I I just don't want to say that I've owned, you know, three trucks in the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. I want to say I've owned five or six trucks. So I, I'm trying to accelerate my my ownership schedule. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, you're uh, one of the stars of one of the most successful, uh, you know, YouTube truck channels. You really should own more trucks. Yeah, that's what I am personally. I know, I know I drive all the trucks here at but the But you office. need to own them for a long yeah. period of time. You need to own them all. You need to buy what? a Ram Power Wagon, right? And then loan it to me. Oh, How money. much money do you think I have? Uh, not much, because you're married too. But yes. um well, that's why you're selling this. So, so, so uh, I, I am not going to announce my next vehicle at this no, moment. No, don't do that. Let, let I, him I, guess. I, first of all, please guess yes. what my next vehicle will be. Um, my truck. I'm sorry. It's a pickup truck. Okay, that's it's all you're saying. It's not a vehicle. But that's all he's saying. It's a pickup truck. Don't say anything else. Okay. Um, so please guess. L- let me know in the comments below. But if you're interested in Andre's pristine Ford F-150 With hybrid, one scratch. With one, one tiny scratch. Which he did almost immediately after buying it, which yeah, I love. Yeah. But uh, no, it's, it's it really is an excellent shape, and uh, it's got tires, new tires on it, so it's leveling little, kit. Yeah, BFGs. So it's got a little, little bit more beef to it. But uh, go to uh, tflbids.com and check it out. It is up there, and yeah, I, I'm and, tempted. And bid. It would be really funny if I bought that. <laughs> if you called me, oh, the winning bidder, uh-huh. uh, huh. Nathan. Hey, yeah, bro, what's up, Nathan? <laughs> I, I, I pro- had I not bought my uh, Hyundai, I might have considered trying to bid on it, but not now. Anyways, so it's out there. I want to try to accelerate my schedule of owner- yeah. uh, owning trucks. And I would, I would have kept this F-150 for, I think, many years. I really enjoyed it. Uh, but I have to move on. So that's kind of where I am. Well, it, it's the Roman Micah school of thought where, and it, we do, this is what we've been doing. Maybe it's business. rubbing off on me. It is rubbing off on you. And that is... For, you know, even with our own personal vehicles, once you guys start getting bored of them, the viewers, it's a really good reason for us to move on to something else. So maybe not just our studio vehicles, but because this is sort of a small family-like business, our own personal vehicles, which means in four years or three years, maybe I should look at another truck. Well, in the future, in four years from now, we'll have like five electric trucks for you to choose from. Mm. Plug-in trucks, maybe. Diesel plug-ins. So well, because my, my wife never gets mad at you, I'm going to tell her in a, like two what? years, Andre told me to move on with trucks. Because Andre said so. Exactly. Yeah. So that way I wonder it, what she will say. She was, Well, she's not going to get mad. She doesn't like getting mad at you. I will close the show on this <laughs> thought. Um, I did have a chance to drive the Ford F-150 Raptor R. Which is something I haven't driven yet, and I'm looking forward to. Uh, yeah, and I'm ho- we're hoping to get it in the fleet, in the test fleet here mm-hmm. uh, pretty soon. But really... When we're thinking about this show, right, and thinking about the best trucks of the year that we've driven, uh, the Raptor R was always in the back of my mind, and I think it still is. It's just bonkers. The only thing that's negative about it is its price, really, $110,000 for so, this truck. Yeah. But it's just bonkers. It's, it's where the Raptor was, you know, with the twin turbo V6, yep. just just shot of adrenaline or testosterone. I don't know what you want to call it, yeah. but but it's got so much power now. And I know there was a drag race published on another channel. Uh, Throttle House did one, right? And they did kind of a side-by-side drag race. And well, the, Raptor, the Raptor didn't do as well as I expected. Okay. But when I drove it, it was just a beast. It was doing four-wheel burnouts. Uh, and by burnouts, I mean just accelerating. Yeah. Uh, I didn't mean to do a burnout. It was just doing it. <laughs> so it's just a ridiculous, absurd truck that I think uh, will be a collector item for, I think, decades to come. 
Yeah. Uh, and there's a whole video out there on the pros and cons of the Raptor R. I will say that just judging by the numbers and what I've seen, it's a little looks a little lighter on its toes, and it may be uh, a more driver-centric uh, off-road super truck, whereas in the TRX might be more of your drag strip off-road super truck. So I don't know. It's, it's an interesting choice between the two of them. Yeah, it's definitely. So the Raptor R weighs way less. Way less. I, I would say anywhere from... What was it 400 pounds to sometimes five depending on the options right uh four to five hundred pounds less than the trx right so that's already an advantage right, right. um and just anyway it's a different character slightly different character truck than the trx but both are bonkers mm -hmm. both are fun and just yeah you you really need to watch out what you're doing in the raptor r because yeah, you'll get to 80 miles per hour before you can blink Right. And that's pretty, off road also. No, I, I, I and, I've heard and, stories, and uh, it's insane. Anyway, guys, uh, you know, I know this is a little disjointed this show with so much stuff that we covered, and we do want to cover more of your answers to these questions. But once again, go to tfltruck.com. Andre will post those as well. Thank you guys for participating. And once again, if you have any comments about what we were talked about, what, what was your favorite truck that we drove this year, put it in the uh, slot below, and we'll try to read it. Yeah, and I want to thank once again, as we close, uh, like Ryan Kelly, Amelia, uh, Akoa, uh, many, many people in the comments section just uh, participating uh, and just letting us know your feedback. We, we love that stuff. We do indeed. Yeah, and also Patreon.com. Yes, thank you on that as well. All right, guys, have a great week, and we will see you again next week. Yep, thank you. Bye-bye.